Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And today's video is all about the best used mirrorless cameras that you can buy right now. This video follows on from one I did last year, which was all about the best used Canon DSLRs that you could buy. And that was mainly focused around sports photography. My channel, if you're new to it, is mostly about sports photography. So these cameras I feature today, I will also call out some of the reasons that they may be suitable for those of you shooting sports. I'm gonna cast a net a little bit wider than just Canon now. I'm gonna include Nikon and Sony in this video as well. So hopefully there's a little bit of something for everyone. I've tried to put these videos into different price bands as well, just to try and give us a little bit of kind of structure as to how we're gonna go through these. And we're gonna start using UK Sterling 500 pounds and under. Now mirrorless cameras are still a fairly new technology, certainly when we talk about the used market and what is kind of becoming available right now. So when we look at 500 pounds and cheaper, it really cuts down what bodies you've got to choose from, but I have picked a couple out. I'm gonna start with the Sony A6000. Now this is the cheapest of the bunch. It's a pretty old body now as we think about cameras and camera tech where it is now in 2024. The A6000 was released back in 2014. Hard to believe mirrorless tech has been around quite that long as we kind of come to the 10 year, 10 year birthday of this particular body. Now it's a great entry level body which you can pick up in the UK used for as little as about 300 pounds right now in some places, obviously depending on the condition and the usage that that camera has had. Another good thing about the A6000, if you are just starting out with photography and you are yet to pick a kind of operating system or brand that you want to shoot with, if you go for the Sony A6000, it does use this Sony E-mount lenses and that E-mount is also used on all of the kind of mirrorless cameras I'm going to feature in this video right up to the pro body. So any E-mount lenses that you buy to use on the a6000 can also be used on any of the other cameras I'm going to feature in this video. So it's a really good starting point from that point of view. Now, is this camera suited for sports photography? Well, let me tell you this. When this camera was released back in 2014, Sony claimed that it had the world's fastest autofocus at that time. It also boasted 11 frames per second on continuous shooting. The camera is an APS-C crop sensor so it's not full frame which can if you want positives on that give you a little bit of extra reach with the whole crop factor thing when you're kind of using um, subjects that are a little bit further away from the camera. Now at one point in its history the Sony a6000 was the best selling mirrorless camera and that was probably because of the the autofocus like we say as well as some of the other functionality that was really ahead of its time and in the market back in 2014 and into 2015 that was still very fledgling when we think of the consumer level mirrorless cameras. Now the interesting thing about this is because of that autofocus and the 11 frames per second on continuous shooting, when this thing was released, quite a few reviewers and, and people in the sports industry and camera industry went out and actually test drove the A6000 from a sports photography perspective. And so there's quite a lot you can go and read up about and see some example images and different things online if you go and search for it. Now, the general consensus is that as great as it was when it released, the technology has actually moved on a lot now, as you probably expect. In low light, the camera will struggle a little bit, but if this is all you can afford and this is your entry point into mirrorless cameras, then it is a pretty good place to start off. All right, next up, I'm gonna talk about the Canon EOS RP. Now, I will admit I'm putting this camera in here partly because I feel I need another option in the 500 pound and under price bracket. The Canon EOS RP is an entry-level mirrorless camera that was released by Canon back in 2019. So it's not all that old in terms of the tech that is in it. It's a good little camera, but if we're talking sports, it's gonna be a bit of a struggle and there are definitely better options out there. Certainly indoor sports, it may be possible to get some shots, but in poor light, you're gonna struggle and you're gonna find the number of usable shots you get with this camera to be pretty low versus how many that you try to take. There are faster cameras available, faster by means of frames per second on continuous shooting, faster by way of the autofocus. Both um, things are pretty important with sport and you can get options for just a little bit more money that will probably do a much better job than the Canon RP. 
However, if you're here to look at mirrorless cameras with a broader kind of context than just sports and you're looking to shoot other types of photography or maybe even video with a mirrorless camera, then the Canon EOS RP is not a bad little option for beginners. It will shoot video in 4K, it's dual pixel CMOS sensor, and it has some Wi-Fi and Bluetooth functionality that puts it ahead of certainly some of the DSLRs around at the same time. Right now here in the UK, you can certainly find the RP available for around 500 pounds, give or take a little bit, dependent on, again, condition and usage. Okay, let's take it up to the next price band, which is 500 pounds to 1,000 pounds. And I've showed on screen kind of the rough um, currency exchanges into like the US dollars and Australian dollars right now at the time of recording. I'm gonna start with the Sony A6400 or A6400. Uh, this was released back in 2019 and is a much more modern version of that A6000 that we spoke about in the last price bracket. If you can stretch a little more to this, then they seem to be around about £600 in the UK right now. Give or take a little, depending on that wear and condition that I'm going to keep repeating throughout this video. So I apologise for that, but it is important to make that distinction as to why used cameras will differ so much in price in some instances. The A6400 also uses that Sony E-mount lens that we spoke about. So they're a great body to start on, again, as you work up through the Canon kind of ecosystem of mirrorless camera bodies. With a shutter speed capability of up to 4,000th of a second, continuous shooting up to 11 frames per second, and the ability to have a silent shutter as high as eight frames per second, this is a pretty solid mirrorless camera to start out with for sports, as well as many other types of photography. It has some other really nice features to it as well, such as an interval timer, which is gonna help you for things like time-lapse photography, if that's what you're into. And also it's gonna shoot 4K video and has strong autofocus capability as well. Now, of course, this isn't gonna rival the functionality of some of the cameras that we're gonna come onto, but in terms of a possible starting point, if this is within your budget, as far as mirrorless cameras are concerned, it really comes with a great set of features and a really quite impressive array of speeds across autofocus, but certainly across those continuous shooting frames per second as well. The silent shutter, that's gonna be a feature of quite a few cameras from this point forwards through this video. Just keep in mind that can be really useful for things like wildlife photography, if you're kind of having to camp down in a hide for hours waiting for a certain animal to come, you don't wanna scare it off. Silent shutters can be really useful for that. And also to keep, keep with the sports theme, um, some sports like golf now, the requirement is in many competitions that you have to have a silent shutter when you're shooting that, which rules pretty much every DSLR right out of it. One last point, this camera will outperform some of the other bodies Sony make that you might pick up in this price range. So for example, the A7 Mark II, I feel the A6400 is a better camera than that one too. So definitely do your research and have a look around, but certainly don't discount this as a solid option. Next up, we have the Canon EOS R10. Released in mid-2022, the Canon EOS R10 is a good little compact camera. It's also full frame, which is a real benefit as we start to get into this price bracket, certainly. And it's fairly lightweight, it has a built-in flash, and it's currently in the used market from about £700, maybe up to about £800. So not cheap, but certainly not expensive for what is quite a good little camera. Also, we're talking a camera that is less than two years old right now at the time of recording in March 2024. Now, this is, a, again, a great option if this is your first foray into mirrorless cameras and if you are already shooting with Canon. The camera was definitely aimed at the beginner, stroke amateur, enthusiast end of the market when Canon released it, but that's not to say it's not a great option if that is you because it is a really cool little camera. It also feels a natural progression from the old Rebel series of Canon DSLRs. So again, if that's you, that is another reason why you might wanna consider this as a suitable body to go to next. Now the R10 does pack a couple of features that are gonna make it a little bit easier for you if you are shooting sports or fast moving wildlife like a bird taking off because on the electric shutter, continuous shooting, it can capture 23 frames per second. And even on a mechanical shutter, you're gonna be hitting speeds of up to 18 frames per second, which is not too bad and will definitely give you a good chance of getting those shots you want and freezing the action as you go. 
Now, a note about the R10 and the other Canon cameras I'm gonna cover from this point forward is they all use the Canon RF lens mount. Now, if you're currently shooting on an old DSLR, you might have the Canon EF lenses or the Canon EFS lenses. Now, one thing Canon did do when they started to produce these mirrorless bodies is they also produced an adapter which would allow you to use your old EF lenses on the RF mount. So if you were gonna buy one of these and maybe you are making that transition from DSLR into mirrorless, I definitely recommend getting one of those adapters so that you don't have to replace all of your lenses onto the RF mount from day one because otherwise that is gonna blow your budget right out of the water. Now shooting sport in poor light is gonna be a bit of a challenge on the R10, so if you are shooting mostly at night or indoors in really badly lit kind of indoor arenas, then it is worth considering and maybe seeing if you can test drive one of these from your local shop before you end up buying. Something else that'll help you out is to get a lens that'll go down to an aperture of 2.8, that'll let more light in. So again, if you do get that RF EF mount adapter I was talking about, picking up an old 70 to 200 f2.8 lens is gonna really help for those lower light situations. But definitely just consider, if you are shooting mostly at night or in poor light, just consider um, what lenses you have available and whether the R10 is gonna be suitable or whether you might just need to lift your budget ever so slightly. All right, next up is the Sony A7 Mark III, and this is gonna set you back in the UK now for a pretty varied price. They start as cheap as around 550 pounds and actually go up right up to that 1,000 pound mark. Now, as you'll notice through this video, Sony are pretty good when it comes to their mirrorless cameras, and they do feature quite extensively in this video. For that, I make no apologies. I am a Canon man in terms of what I use, but the Sony bodies and the Sony lenses are really, really impressive. The Sony A7 Mark III is a brilliant body that you can now find here used, as I said, for from about £500, which for the tech that's in it is really, really cheap and good value in my opinion. Obviously, again, you're going to be looking at condition and the amount of wear and use that that camera has had and that will impact that price that you have to pay to pick it up used. Now, despite being classed as a basic model by Sony themselves, the A7 Mark III does share some of the same features that the higher end members of the Sony mirrorless family also have packed into them. So the A7 Mark III is full frame and some of the cool features include the continuous eye focus or the continue eye autofocus system, which basically follows your eyes and what you're looking at and will focus automatically on those. Now for sports, that is a really powerful tool to have if it works properly. And in addition to that, it also has real good tracking ability. So that again is gonna help you out with sports a lot. In terms of the speed, well, on frames per second, continual shooting it is gonna hit 10 frames per second, which feels a little bit slow compared to some of the cameras we're gonna talk about. But if you kind of think back to the DSLR range, which by the way, I still shoot in almost all the time. Um, 10 frames per second is certainly pretty good. And if you're starting off in sports, or even if you're shooting at maybe a semi-pro level, that is gonna be quick enough in most instances for you to get some good shots and burst of action. Outside of the sports capabilities, it will shoot multiple 4K video modes and can oversample up to 6K. Something else which is really helpful, whatever you're shooting, certainly wildlife or sports, is that this thing is weather sealed. Something I can tell you from experience of the bodies I use is an absolute godsend in many situations. Let's move on up to the next camera in the pecking order and that is a Sony A9. This also is retail and used right now from about 800 pound up to that 1,000 pound mark. There are a few creeping maybe up to 1,100 pound that have barely been used by the look of it. This is the final camera I wanna to touch on in this bracket, and it's another really, really good one, to be honest. The Sony A9 was released back in 2017, and at that point, it was Sony's flagship camera. So right away, you know that when this was released, this was the camera to have if you were a Sony shooter. Now, this camera also uses the Sony E-mount lenses, so again, that is a benefit if you are gonna be using um, Sony lenses for a number of years within the mirrorless ecosystem, then you don't have to replace them all and you can keep your kit as you upgrade. Now, when this was re released, it was heralded as being pretty innovative. Thanks in no small part to shooting 20 frames per second, blackout free shots, and a high speed stacked 24.2 megapixel sensor. At the time, it really was pretty groundbreaking. 
Now, for those of you who aren't interested in sport or will be shooting a lot more beside just sports, let's talk about very quickly the other features and the capabilities that this thing has. It goes without saying that you are going to be able to shoot beautiful 4K movies. It has dual media slots and a battery design that is this or a battery that is designed for professional use. So you're going to get lots of hours of shooting with that, as long as it hasn't degraded over time. I'm talking about used gear here, obviously. If you are shopping in this price bracket, I definitely recommend having a good read up about this camera. There's a load of videos, a load of articles and magazines from the time it was released, and also comparison sites that let you kind of compare the functionality and the features of this versus other cameras, both Sony ones and from other brands as well. If your budget stretches a little further, then obviously we're gonna go on and talk about the Mark II and also the Mark III during this video, so you might wanna stick around for that as well. All right, let's move into the 1,000 to 2,000 pound bracket. And we are gonna go straight into the A9 Mark II. Now, we just heard that the last one, the Mark I, was a flagship professional camera. And so the Mark II was also aimed at professional shooters. And it was also aimed predominantly at sports photographers. In fact, even if you go to the page on the Sony website right now for this body, the see and set and the image at the top, is of a photographer in a stadium shooting some sort of sport. So this is definitely a camera suited for sports photography. Versus the Mark I, the Mark II offered an upgrade in a few different areas, most notably improved weather sealing and less buffering when taking a continuous burst of shots. Buffering is the time it takes to write the images to the card on all the cameras, you might notice if you take a big burst of shots in a goal mouth scramble in football or if cars are coming through a chicane on a racetrack, um, sometimes if you take too many shots at high resolution or in RAW, it can take a while to write them to card. And if it hits the buffer, then it is gonna stop you shooting anymore until those um, shots are written. So when we talk about better buffering, increased buffering speeds like the Mark II, that is what we're talking about. That said, the Mark II is a little more chunky than the Mark I to hold. So if you're kind of sensitive to the weight and feel of a camera body, then you may wanna compare them side by side. Go and find some in a, in a camera store and maybe um, try both of them out in your hand to see which you are more comfortable with. Also bear in mind if you are of course moving from the Mark I already up to the Mark II. Now the camera isn't cheap, it is around £1,600 used here in the UK right now. The kind of ones with less wear can almost touch that £2,000 ceiling in this price bracket. But let's make no kind of bones about this. If you are shooting Sony and you are a sports photographer, or even just looking for a really good professional grade mirrorless camera in the used market, then this is a great option for you. If your budget stretch is still higher again and you want Sony, we're gonna talk about the Mark III in just a few minutes time. So again, stick around for that. But right now we're gonna move on to the Canon EOS R7. This is a little bit cheaper than the previous body we mentioned, so we're around 1,200 pound right now here in the UK to pick up one of these used. Now this is, the R7 is a um, successor to the 7D and the 7D Mark II in a DSLR range of cameras. I own both of those cameras, so I know them very well. Um, the R7 is still a crop sensor, so it has still got the APS-C sensor on it, so you're not on a full frame body if you are using the R7. It is fairly new, it was released around 2022, I think, and as it is still fairly new and has some great functionality in it, the prices aren't moving that much. I've been monitoring these since the back end of last year and it hasn't really come down post Christmas and into the new year just yet. However, depending on when you're watching this, as 2024 draws on, I suspect it might drop ever so slightly as a couple of new bodies from Canon do come into the marketplace and kind of have that knockdown effect on that used market. Now we've talked about speed a fair bit to this point, so let's continue in that vein right now. And in terms of frames per second, when we're talking about continual shooting, you can shoot at 15 frames per second on the mechanical shutter on the R7, or up to 30 frames per second on the R6, which is really quite a crazy amount of shots. ISO performance is good, but it's not gonna perform as well in low light as say the R6, which we're going to come on to in just a few minutes time. As I said, I Sony used both the 7D and the 7D Mark II in the DSLR age. I was really quite impressed with what the R7 has got packed into it. I think it's a great solid all-rounder for, for still photography, for a bit of sport and for video if you are looking to go into mirrorless shooting. Now, as I said, as someone who owned both the 7D and the 7D Mark II 
the SLRs. I was really interested to see what Canon was going to pack into the R7. I think it's a great all-rounder, a really good body if you do sports as well as other types of photography and you dabble in a bit of video as well. I think this really offers some great versatility. Okay, let's move on to the R6 right now then. And the first thing to note about the Canon EOS R6 is it is a full frame camera when comparing directly to the R7, which we just spoke about. So straight away, this is the first change to note. Price wise, whereas the R7 was hanging around at about 1200 pound, I did see some R6s that are around the 1100 pound bracket, but also go up to the 13 and even 1400 pounds as well. It's classed as the ultimate hybrid camera and it's hard to disagree with that. It's got an ability to shoot silently at up to 20 frames per second. So that again is on that electric shutter and it's got good image stabilization, impressive low light shooting and also has a 20 megabit resolution and it can shoot video in 4K at up to 60p. So again, this is a really good all-rounder of a camera and at full frame as well with the prices now dropping to around 11, 1200 pound. I think it's a great option to certainly be considering at this point. Now, the reason this is a little bit cheaper despite being full frame than the R7 is this was released a couple of years earlier in 2020. So maybe some of the tech is a little older. I think if I was choosing between the R6 and R7, I think I would just about go for the R6, but I don't think there's that much to choose from. Um, if you shoot more in poor light than death or low light um, for things that you need speed for, sports, wildlife, um, maybe some sort of street photography or something, then I think I would definitely go for the R6 over the R7. But certainly check out the specs, consider it alongside what you're shooting and what prices you can get it from at any point because these markets do change quite frequently. All right, let's move up to the next price bracket. And this one is quite a wide bracket, unfortunately. I apologize for that. It's 2,000 to 4,000 pound. And we're gonna start by sticking with Canon and talk about the R6 Mark II, which is another reason the R6 Mark I we just spoke about is a little bit cheaper than you might expect, certainly versus the R7. And that is because the R6 has the Mark II now out. Now the R6 Mark II was released in 2022. So that's about two years after that Mark I. And it did offer an upgrade on its predecessor thanks to some pretty smart improvements across the board. So one of the things that helps set the R6 Mark II apart from the Mark I is its autofocus. And it is really, really good and a great kind of tool to have in your bag. So when the Mark II was released, the kind of the focus subject recognition tool was expanded. This now includes um, trains, horses, and airplanes. So again, if you're shooting fast moving subjects for sports, for wildlife, for aviation photography, or whatever it is, then these autofocus modes are gonna be really helpful and make tracking of your subject and keep them nice and sharp a lot easier. Additionally, the speed of which it can shoot was increased, so you can now achieve speeds on the Mark II of 40 frames per second of bare shooting when using the electric shutter, which is, again, a pretty remarkable increase. And the other thing that makes this really important is that the rolling shutter, so that distortion, if you like, when using an electric shutter, was quite significantly reduced according to the reviews I've read and the people I've spoke to who use this camera. So it was reduced a lot versus the Mark I. So again, depending on your budget, this might be a really sensible upgrade to go straight to the R2, uh, sorry, the R6 Mark II rather than the Mark I. Right now though, it is a bit of a step up in price. So you're looking at probably just over 2,000 pounds to pick up a Mark II right now. Okay, let's talk about the R5. And this is a great body, but it is gonna cost you a little bit more right now from around 2,200 up to 2,800 here in the UK used market. And I'll try and put the um, currency conversions on screen now, just so you can see a couple of uh, the, the price in a couple of markets right now and how that translates. Now, probably the thing that sets the R5 apart again is autofocus and Canon really threw the kitchen sink at this when it was released because when it was released, they were able to stand by a boast of having class leading autofocus speed in the R5, um, a speed of just 0.05 seconds, which makes it brilliant for sports photographers because if something happens really quick, if your autofocus can pick up subjects that quickly, the risk of you missing that shot is obviously a lot less. The R5 is a beast and it really is quite revolutionary in a lot of what it does. It can shoot 8K raw video at 29.97 frames per second, 4K 10-pit video at 119.9 
frames per second. Pretty amazing video capture functionality. Talking about the speed of continuous shooting then this thing is going to hit 20 frames per second and has a 45 megapixel resolution. Now this was only released back in 2020 and it was as I said a bit of a groundbreaker when it comes to mirrorless tech although it was later upstaged when they released the R3 and we're going to talk about that amazing camera in a few minutes time as well. As I said, the R5 prices now start from just over £2,000. So it's not cheap, it's a lot of money, but if you have got that budget and this is the type of thing you're looking to invest in, then it's certainly worthy of your attention. All right then, let's get back into the world of Sony. And I'm going to talk about the Sony A7R5, um, or A7RV, however you want to say it. Uh, right now, these are from around 2,800 up to 3,000 pound used. So again, these prices are going up and up and up as we go through these cameras. Now, if you hadn't noticed, we're into the realm right now with these cameras of some pretty incredible and powerful mirrorless cameras that from a DSLR age a few years ago, these types of specs are quite mind blowing in many ways. So the A7RV is a 61 megapixel full frame camera that packs an improved processing engine, low noise, and impressive autofocus system. It's also gonna shoot video in 8K. It has eight stop sta image stabilization and boasts consistently accurate exposure and color. Um, all those things make it incredibly useful. Um, I won't go through the many different scenarios in which those functionalities will come useful to you as a stills, either as a stills photographer or a videographer, um, but yeah, this is this is a pretty powerful bit of kit right here. Now that said, I'm gonna say from a sports perspective, this isn't a camera I will buy. As impressive as it is, in this price bracket, I think it can get faster, because frames per second on continual shooting, this thing is only gonna give you 10 frames per second, and while that was good a few years ago in this modern era, of mirrorless cameras, as we've already heard about cameras shooting 40 frames per second, then 10 just isn't gonna cut it from something that's likely to cost you around 3,000 pounds. If you are after a super mirrorless body that will smash video and do a lot more besides, then this is obviously a formidable bit of kit. Um, and definitely, again, worth, if it's in your budget, of doing your homework and seeing if this is the one for you. All right, next up, and we're gonna welcome Nikon to the party now with the Z8. And again, he's gonna start off at around 2,800, up to about three and a half thousand pound for this right now. Uh, it's a compact yet impressively powerful camera. Nikon boasts that it's compact yet packs many of the features of a flagship camera. And that is true, and one of the reasons that this Z8 has to be included in this video roundup. If you're a keen content creator right through to professional, this body has likely got kind of features and functionality that is going to interest you and help make your life a little bit easier. Amazingly, it has loads of the technology that was in the flagship Z9, repurposed, but it is in this compact 30% smaller body that really makes it a really interesting proposition. And when I say about content creators, if you're out and about vlogging or doing bits of video content on the move, the smaller the lighter the camera is can often be a lot more beneficial. For me, the Z8 is kind of really excelling on the video side of things with 8.3K 60p 12-bit raw video among the headline features. I know that's a mouthful, go check out the full spec on the Nikon website for more info on it, but it is frankly very impressive. It's also incredibly quick for stills. You'll see the headline speed for stills being quoted at, wait for it, 120 frames per second. Crazy, I know. Hang on, here comes a small print. But that 120 frames per second will only be at 11 megapixels. Still, not bad. It will, however, produce stills of 45.7 megapixels at 30 or 60 frames per second. So even though that 140 is crazy quick, you can still hit speeds of 30 and 60 on higher resolution images. So this is a formidable speed machine when we're talking about stills as well. Another feature I just want to mention on the Z8 as well that becomes a feature on I think all the cameras from this point on is it's got something called pre-capture release. Basically what that does is it takes a shot before you actually press the shutter so that if you are a little bit slow getting your camera up and into position or a little bit slow getting that shot off, it is going to take a shot a moment before you start shooting just to help you capture that action. All right, let's stick with Nikon and take that price bracket even higher, or certainly the price within this bracket. I'm gonna talk about the flagship Nikon 
Z9 or Z9, depending on where you are from in the world and how you pronounce your Zs and Zs. Now this is going to set you back right now at about £4,000 in the UK. You can get them a little bit cheaper, around 3 7 if you're lucky, um, but certainly it is not cheap. It's an incredibly powerful body, this one, as you'd expect from a flagship, and it is the choice of all professionals who are shooting Nikon and are shooting mirrorless right now. Capable of shooting 20 frames per second in RAW on continuous shooting mode, and it has a buffer in that mode of up to a thousand shots. So that's pretty crazy. 20 frames per second, raw images up to a thousand on the buffer before it will begin to struggle. So perfect if you're taking a whole load of shots of really quick motorsport or a huge goal mouth scramble in soccer or football, whatever it is you're shooting. It will also go to 30 frames per second in high res JPEGs or 120 frames per second in low res JPEGs. Nikon boasts that the buffer is actually 5,000 images continuous shooting when using a high-end CF Express card. And again, that is pretty incredible. I find a lot of these specs to be utterly mind-blowing uh, when thinking back to when I was trying to buy a camera a few years ago and certainly in the DSLR range, age, and uh, I was looking at the functionality then, these kind of speeds were just not even imagined at that point. The autofocus on this thing is mind-blowingly good as well. It has a great EVF, that is electronic viewfinder, so that is um, kind of the same, or sorry, that bit of technology exists on every mirrorless camera. That is when you look through um, what used to be the, the conventional viewfinder, you're looking at a live image. Um, and as you tweak the settings, you will see that live in the electronic viewfinder on mirrorless cameras. So the EVF is really good. The autofocus is brilliant and it really packs a punch when it comes to video as well. Hit a maximum resolution of 4K UHD at 30p. It can also produce 8K at 60p as well. So again, this is pretty adept when it comes to shooting high quality video. All right, we're back to Canon with the Canon EOS R3. Again, around 3,800 to 4,000 pounds to pick one of these up right now. Very expensive, but you're gonna get a lot of kit for that. Now, the R3 is a super camera, and as a Canon fan, I was glued to the kind of the, the pre-release buildup on this camera and did a few videos on it myself because the specs as this was getting developed and teased out were pretty amazing especially when you consider this is not Canon's flagship camera. The R3 never has been nor intended to be the flagship for Canon camera. It is the most powerful mirrorless camera they have to date. That will soon be kind of out of the window when the R1 comes out. That will be the flagship Canon camera in the mirrorless range, taking on the mantle from the 1DX range that we knew and love so much on DSLRs. Now some loads of standout features again on this, it's gonna hit 30 frames per second continuous shooting. It has the eye control autofocus system, which is the first time I think Canon brought this back on the cameras, and I say back because they had it way back when, maybe about 15, 20 years ago on cameras, took it away because it wasn't very good, and now I've brought it right back with the R3, and it is expected to be in the R1 as well when that is released this year. If video is your thing, then a fully articulating thing screen is certainly going to be an asset to you. Canon released a firmware update in last summer for this camera, so I think July 23, that allowed it to shoot up to, and this is a record for this video, 195 frames per second. Obviously, that was in a customised mode, so I'm guessing, I don't know, but I think the resolution was lower. Um, but yeah, 195 frames per second is a possibility on the R3, which again is frankly insane. There were though some perceived negatives on the R3, and that is probably partly because it isn't a flagship, it was never gonna have all of the bells and whistles and hit all of the expectations at this point. It has split CF Express and SD card slots rather than twin CF Express, and only a 24.1 megapixel sensor. But again, those things may not trouble you too much. All in all, I think the R3 is a really good camera and a great camera that is soon gonna face some stiff competition when the R1 comes out. I also think the R3 is probably gonna see some significant, or certainly by a few hundred pounds, price drops on used when the R1 drops, because I think there'll be a lot of 
pros using the R3 right now because they wanted to get onto mirrorless or semi-pros who, who have an eye on the R1. And I think when the R1 drops, we will see that transition from the R3 into the R1, which will hopefully flood the market with R3s and make it a little bit cheaper for those looking to get hold of one. All right, and last but by no means least is a camera that you can pick up for around £2,000 if you're really, really lucky, but in all likelihood it is going to be in the £3,000 or even more than £4,000. I've seen such a variation of prices for this in the last week. It is crazy. And it's our friends at Sony again, and it is the Sony A1. So if it's megapixels you're after, which many people seem to be today, then this camera is certainly one for you because it boasts a massive 50.1 megapixels. It has a continuous shooting speed of up to 30 frames per second and a max video resolution of 8K. It packs a load of great features for both stills and video, and I have seen professional photographers sitting a pitch side here in England shooting professional soccer in all weathers with this thing. So it is definitely an option for sports if that is your thing. So the 30 frames per second is with the electric shutter. With the mechanical shutter, you're gonna, um, I think, top out at 10 frames per second when you are in that continual kind of shooting or burst mode. And if you are doing sports or video or anything else where you're out in the field, taking a lot of shots or over many hours, then the battery on this thing is known to be really, really good. One of Sony's best to date, actually. Even when you are shooting video at 8K, 30p, this thing isn't gonna overheat, so a lot of cameras do struggle when you're shooting at really high video quality over a period of time, they'll overheat, they might turn themselves off or whatever else. This camera does not really overheat when shooting at those high video qualities. So again, that is gonna be a massive help if you're taking some prolonged video footage. Negatives, well, I've not used one myself, but reports suggest that the 30 frames per second on the electric shutter isn't actually guaranteed and depending on different scenarios, you might only get 15 to 20 megapixels out of it not megapixels, 15 to 20 frames per second out of it. However, this is a brilliant camera and we can't get away from that fact or really debate it. The autofocus is sublime, the image quality magnificent, and the performance in low light is mightily impressive as well, as you'd probably expect at this price point. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. I hope all that made sense. It was just a whistle-stop tour of the used mirrorless market right now. Please use the comments below to share your opinions, your tips, maybe your experiences of what you've bought, or maybe you're where you're at in a buying cycle, and hopefully we can get some conversation. Either I'll reply to comments, or quite often you guys reply and talk to each other, which is a really nice thing to have happen. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, I'd dearly love you to, but regardless, hopefully I'll see you on our next video.